and welcome to the 30-second Security Thought Leadership webinar. We've been with you every Tuesday and Thursday throughout lockdown where we've been examining a topic of central importance to the security sector. And the idea of thought leadership is to critique the type of security that we have today in order that we may have a better type of security tomorrow. And today the topic is something that has emerged from previous webinars. Thinking about innovation, security and crime prevention, where can we look and what can we find? And the idea is that what we're trying to do with this subject of innovation is challenge and understand what it means and how it might have changed during this COVID-19 crisis. Um, it seems to me that suppliers are regularly asked to be innovative as if it's as easy as that. And sometimes clients are not clear what they want from innovation. So today I have four panelists from different parts of the world, from the UAE, from Finland, from the United States and the United Kingdom, who are gonna give their views on this topic. Now, uh, in a minute, I'm gonna ask each of them for, uh, to introduce themselves to you. And once they've done that, I will then invite them to make an opening statement. Once the opening statement's been made, I will then come to you, the audience, to ask your questions. Can I ask you please to use your question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, the question and answer button, and we will endeavor then to incorporate your question into, this, uh, into the discussion. Okay, so without further ado, let's go to our panel. And first of all, to Finland and ask Timu. Timu, your introduction, please. Hello all, my name is Teemu Santonen. I'm a principal lecturer from Laurea University of Applied Science in Finland. And we are the leading security educator in Finland and doing also heavily on the service design education. Timu, thank you very much indeed. From Finland, let's go to the Chicago in the United States. Nicholas. Yes, uh, but I'm from the UAE actually. Oh, sorry, sorry from the UAE. Yeah, I jumped ahead of myself. Yes, yeah, sorry, UAE. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So hi everybody, I'm uh, Nicholas Garcia, 40 years old, based in the UAE, working for a company called Idemia. I'm uh, the regional director of sales for Middle East Africa in the, the biometric devices uh, field. Thank you very much indeed. And we will this time go from UAE to Chicago. And Louis, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Yes. Hello, everyone. This is Lou Chavez. I'm a principal engineer. I'm with the company Underwriters Laboratories, UL. Um, I have a global uh, oversight as a technical lead for my company in areas that involve physical security, electronic security, alarm transport or central station services, and cybersecurity. So I've been involved in codes and standards and uh, uh, all kinds of staff technical competency adventures within my company and I've been with them for 34 years about half of that time I've been involved in security. Thank you very much indeed and uh, um, finally to the UK and Stephen. Stephen introduce yourself please. Thank you Martin. Uh, I'm Stephen Kenny from Active Communications and I'm our industry liaison lead for Northern Europe. Um, I'm a dedicated resource that helps me with specifying and designing security systems and uh, I support industry associations like ACC International, Time Care, the IT Security Foundation, as well as providing sort of new standards and trying to bring uh, industry trends and, and innovation to the forefront. Thank you, Stephen. Just to, just to say, Stephen, you're, you seemed a little quiet there. So maybe while um, we do the introductions, we can just have a look at your sound. Um, OK, so now let's go to our opening statements. There's an international panel of um, enormous expertise across this subject of innovation. And I'll ask each of my panelists now for their opening statement. Three minutes for their views on the current issue. Let's go to Timu. Timu, over to you first. OK, thank you. Uh, so I come from the service design point of view, uh, and there's a two kind of sections over there. First, we have to, and to, to make sure that we are developing the right things. And that's kind of basically understanding, discovering, exploring what is the problem, and then kind of conceptualize and crystallize what is the problem. And the second part is developing things right. How we make sure that our solution is actually working. For that, we are typically using co-creation solutions and uh, kind of an uh, iterative testing with the real users in real life settings. And today's topic is that uh, what we can learn and where to look for. And I'm coming from the uh, diversity point of view. So more diverse the, the developers and environments are, 
there's a high, high likelihood to come up something different. And do you understand the different the elements of the diversity? So we have cultural diversity, like today we have a persons all, all around the world. Then we have organizational diversity. It's totally different thing if you're talking with the university person, private sector, public sector, or NGO people. Then of course we have different types of users. We have people with the disabilities, the, in the, in the, we have uh, people who are criminal backgrounds, we have like, let's say normal people and so forth. And cross-functional diversity, what we have, we have people in the top management positions, uh, you know, the lower level workers, marketing people, engineers and so forth. And then we have a disciplinary and cross-industry diversity. Many of the novel innovations are typically coming from the different fields. So basically, my suggestion for, for today's topics is that the security industry should be looking from outside the security industry in order to come up with something new. And it's definitely sure that if, if we are keeping doing things exactly that we've been doing previously, so we will end up in a similar innovations that we've been doing previously, like incremental innovation, instead of searching for like a radical innovation. Thank you very much indeed, Timu. Appreciate your uh, introduction. Interesting points about diversity there. Uh, Nicholas, uh, over to you, your opening statement, please. Yes, thank you. So as I said, my name is Nicholas. Uh, I'm based in the UAE. Before that, I was 18 years in South Africa. Uh, obviously, the, the, the regions are different one another. There is always things evolving, so that's quite interesting. I, uh, I've been working with, uh, in the biometrics industry for over 15 years. Uh, change of ch things, sorry, have changed tremendously since then. I, um, and, and they continue to change, obviously, with the COVID situation that we've got now. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of strange situation. It's never going to, you know, uh, stop evolving, so, which is quite good. Um, I, I like so much innovation that I, uh, I wrote a book about biometrics so that people can actually uh, understand how it works, how it works today, how it was working yesterday, how it's going to work in, in, uh, in future. So I think today uh, the topic is, is very interesting with that regards uh, be, because of uh, all those elements that I, I just uh, mentioned. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, let's go over to uh, Louis over in Chicago. Louis, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, my perspective, I, you know, I really have seen a lot of different changes in the security environment. Uh, lots of innovations. Uh, my organization is, is generally involved in, in new products, new product development. We see um, manufacturers' products as they're getting ready to launch their, their uh, equipment and systems. Um, I've seen a lot of diversity and uh, new thoughts on where, you know, security and crime prevention is going. And I, I think that we're all recognizing that there's a lot of opportunity in the security area. Um, I do not think it's a stagnant field at all. If anything, I think the security area is one of probably one of the most growing uh, areas of technology. Um, some of the things that, you know, I, I believe that are, really coming up to uh you know the limelight or the focus are you know uh, a lot of iot devices uh cyber security is very big smart devices smart buildings um there's a lot of you know proven technologies out there already uh such as physical security that are being integrated with new technologies and I think that's that's amazing that you know we have all these things going on. Um, I look forward to to continually working with the security industry. I see there's a lot of opportunity to utilize different solutions, um, starting to incorporate cloud services, um, you know, the professional products versus user installed products. Those are all things on on the uh, that are coming our way or that are already out there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different codes and standards being written and best practices being published. And I think that's all helping to drive innovation and technology for security. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Luis. Uh, um, now, Stephen, let's go to you. Stephen, let's hope we got this sound sorted out. How do you sound? 
Is it crystal clear now? Much, much better. So if you just Excellent. do your introduction again, just say so Okay. Know. Yeah, sorry. So I'm Steve Kenny, Industry Liaison Manager for Axis Communications. Um, I support our, our customers across Northern Europe. I also sit on a couple of different industry associations for ASIS International, Tiny G, the IT Security Foundation, really looking at sort of how we can drive stand, uh, new standards and I, I, I guess bring innovation um, just to, to the forefront, really. Um, so to go into a, a bit of uh, some of the, the, the really important points that I'm seeing at the moment, um, I, I absolutely agree with Louis as well. Um, I, I think we have innovation in the marketplace, but actually we're hindered by the adoption of innovation rather than it not being readily available or, or being seen. Um, and when we see some of the disruptive technologies that are being brought to the forefront, actually there's a bit of sort of hesitance to people adopting these or even considering them. Um, so a couple of the, the things that I, I, I stress is, it is utilizing a 30 year old infrastructure or topology and architecture the right thing for businesses to do? And it absolutely isn't because we're not adopting uh, great standards um, from the IoT space. And um, if we look at traditional systems that have traditionally been a reactive security measure is reacting to, to an event or an alarm the right thing to do these days or should we take more of a proactive stance because the innovation is there and um, it's just about people adopting these and then obviously Louis mentioned things that are are fairly close to my heart with cybersecurity, privacy regulations around GDPR compliance all of these good things and um, absolutely need adopting and, and the technology is there um, and then if we if we focus on on where we are today no one ever foresaw the challenges of, of 2020 um, but what we are seeing is is the, the the challenges that we see face today are they are the controlling and dictating the way systems are being deployed and designed but are these systems are they are they fit for purpose as in how we're using them today but can we use them tomorrow and, and is this going to leave a massive hole in someone's security budget because there's been a knee-jerk reaction to, to addressing something that, that hopefully isn't too far away um, from being sort of closed? And I, I guess hopefully that, that, that'll all come out in the wash in today's discussion. So thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good, to, good to have you uh, um, loud and clear, Stephen. OK, look, some really interesting points in there. Can I um, just say to the audience, uh, can you use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, please? So I'm um, picking up on uh, some of the points you already, away, uh, already made. Michael Gibbs, uh, um, uh, a former panellist, by the way, uh, on, uh, on these webinars, uh, makes the point that security already does take from other industries. And he points to um, facial recognition, access control, uh, um, autonomous uh, driving vehicles, etc. Uh, um, and the question is, is there really a problem with innovation? And I suppose um, I'm going to come back to you first, Stephen, because uh, you sort of touched on this. Um, is the problem that there is a lack of innovation, innovation, or is that not the problem and it's merely about the way that innovations are being not used or not used very wisely? Stephen, your thought first, and I'll come to Lewis uh, second. So, so my, my, my thought is that, that we're in a, an industry that have done this role for a very, very long time. And, and the old saying of we've always done it this way tends to hinder innovation. And if we look at, I know there's a lot of topics around sort of frictionless access control, which was mentioned and facial recognition. These are all systems that are readily available today, have been deployed, have got return on investment models to demonstrate their value. But there's a lot of hesitance to people actually deploying them. So I, the, the technology is there, they're just not being deployed. And, and Steve, just to push you a second, what's what's the what's the major cause of the hesitancy? Um, I, I think that people don't understand the capabilities of the technology because it's new. Uh, and if if you've designed a system for thirty years and it's never let you down, people are thinking, well, why would I change? Yeah. Okay. Lewis, your thoughts on that uh, on uh, uh, Mike's question about is there really a problem with innovation or is it down to this hesitancy to adopt? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that there is a problem with innovation. I think, um, you know, the security area is probably one of the more, one of the more innovative areas of uh, technology. Um, Stephen mentioned something that I believe, you know, it's sort of uh, close to what I do, and that's products that are fit for purpose. So a lot of times there are innovations going on, um, but it's important to validate or confirm that they are fit for purpose because technology is moving very fast and um, we can do a lot of different things. There's always a solution, you know, in software especially, there's always a solution for something, but it doesn't really meet the, the, the intended application as a fit for purpose. Um, I think that's something that we need to be uh, conscious of. 
and uh, so I don't I don't believe there's any any lack or any any slowdown in innovations for security areas. Okay, let's come to the very specific area, uh, Nicholas. You 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 work in the area of biometrics, uh, um, where where it seems a lot is happening. You've written the book on it. Must be a lot happening. Um, um Nicholas, um, do you, what do you see in your area as the main barriers to adopting um, a, a more progressive approach to being innovative? Yeah, so um, I think as uh, Stephen and Louis mentioned, you know, the uh, well on one side you've got the the manufacturers which are bringing new technologies new innovation to the market on the other hand you've got uh, many players you know in the chain between the manufacturer and um, the end user actually so you need time to educate them so that's uh, the first thing the second thing is what we've seen over the the past few years is clearly a shift from the traditional biometrics where you you use contact uh, readers to uh, contactless um, solutions. Uh, obviously with the COVID, you, we've seen an acceleration of this trend, but the trend had already started before the COVID uh, for many reasons, for convenience, for hygiene, for uh, you know, people uh, like technologies, they like gadgets. So if you, for instance, if you touch uh, a sensor, people are used to that uh, when they, whatever they do in their life, when they ask for a passport. Uh, if you just show your face for facial recognition, or if you wave your hand to read the fingers without touching anything, people like that. So uh, we're going more and more towards the, the contactless um, solution trend. And we've been hearing about this actually, uh, uh, Nicholas, on previous webinars about this uh, contactless and how attractive it is, as you say, for hygiene reasons. I and mean, are you seeing a dramatic uptake in this sort of technology? We've seen a dramatic uptake. So obviously, the uh, the technology, uh, you know, being fairly new. So when I say fairly new, we started to develop those products back in 2012 uh, for, for fingerprint contactless technology uh, and facial even uh, before that. But uh, it has to go through all the the players. People needs to see. They need to. So in this case, not touch, but experience. What's, what they are doing with the reader, what it will bring to them. And uh, as uh, Stephen was saying, you know, when you've been doing the same thing for 20 years or 30 years, uh, why change? So as we move along and we are uh, showing the product uh, to, to, to the, the end users and to all the players in the market, uh, they, they do adopt it. So it's a bit like, uh, like an um, exponential curve. So yes, we have seen a trend, um, a big adoption rate, yeah. Okay, I'm also going to get Timu's uh, take on this one because it strikes me as a really biggie. Uh, um, Timu, your, your point about Mike's question, the, the, identifying the barriers to adopting uh, um, innovation in a more progressive way. Yeah, <clears throat> so in a way what I heard from the other panelists, you had a really strong product orientation and many other industries has actually gone to the not focusing on the product development, but focusing on the developing business model and services. So, and, and also I've been working in many industries, helping them to innovate. And to, it's very typical that companies say that our product is great, but the users are not adopting it. So my kind of a counter argument is typically that companies are overestimating the value of their solution, product or service compared to what the users are really wanting to pay for them. And that's kind of a traditional, you know, the, the, the trap over there. And the one of the problems is in, is in a way when, when we're following this uh, service design approach is that we try to early on engage the users already when we are actually ideating the solutions to make sure that it's actually fitting to actual need what they have. And then, you know, that that reduces the risk of failure in a way. And on the other hand, as a counter argument, I could also say that how come industries like tele, telecommunication, like, like, you know, the iPhone, we, we buy a new iPhone each year, you know, that, and people are happily adopting that. So, and in many other examples are over there as, as well. So my counter argument would be in, in a way, it's, it's actually, there must be something wrong if, you know, the companies and, 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 and the customers are not adopting the solutions. Either they are too expensive or they are not uh, serving the purpose what, what they are kind of expecting. 
Okay, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Let me come to uh, very quickly, uh, Stephen. Stephen, um, um, Roman Abaji uh, um, from Nigeria asks uh, um, the same question. Um, is cost a big factor here? Um, and, and in some ways, obviously, these things cost money. But I mean, think Timu's point, and maybe behind uh, um, uh, Roman Abaji's question, is there's a misjudgment on the seller end about how valuable these are. And that's inhibiting progress. I'll come to Stephen. I'll come to, to Lewis and Nicholas very quickly, if you wouldn't mind, Stephen. Uh, yeah. So, so if the only focus on the the associated cost is on the hardware and it doesn't focus on the business value, then I think things can come across as quite expensive. And um, if we look at if we look at security as a business enabler, we look at how security technologies can can form some sort of optimization, business efficiencies. That's when we start to see the the cost, the hardware costs sort of diminish in value, because we actually offer offer so much more back to, um, back to the, the the users that are looking at deploying these systems. Okay, uh, uh, Lewis, just quickly on for you on this. I mean, it's a biggie, isn't it? This point about cost and that the judgment isn't being got right between what people are charging and the value they place on at the other end. Lewis. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I believe that cost is a factor. I think, you know, one of the ways of managing costs for, for a product is by um, incorporating the technology and addressing issues during the product development life cycle. So for instance, if you're gonna have an electronic product that is IOT, it's connected through the internet, it would be uh, prudent to include cybersecurity during the product development life cycle. And of course that will have an effect on costs. Yeah, I mean, is it? But you can manage it, you can manage it if it's incorporated while you're developing the product versus putting a patch on it after the product's been developed. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, let me, Nicholas, you're also at the, at the sharp end on this, so let me give you a chance just to make a comment. Nicholas, very briefly, yes. if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, for sure. So, obviously, uh, if you look at it uh, that way, uh, the lifespan of a um, uh, security system when an end user invests is between five to seven years, right? So, if they invest, they need to make sure that they invest in the right technology, and that's our role as manufacturer to educate the market for them to know exactly what to, to invest in. Uh, and um, basically, you know, if you look at uh, the iPhone, as uh, Timu was uh, mentioning, and uh, the security um, products, the difference is that the iPhone, you buy it because you, you want to, to show a standard, you want to enjoy your, your iPhone. Security is basically a great budget. Uh, it's, it's a budget that you need to invest in. Uh, you want to make sure that you make the right investment. But I wouldn't compare an iPhone to a security device because clearly uh, I like my iPhone, but um, I like my job, I like uh, technology, I like the security industry, but I wouldn't buy uh, a biometric reader to keep in my pocket just because uh, I like it. You, you see what I mean? Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move on because we've got questions raining in on us from uh, around the world, actually. And we've got two coming up here. I'm going to come to you first, Timo, if I might. Um, um, and I'll tell you something that uh, um, has cropped up on a previous webinar. And that is this thinking that technology is always presented as an unqualified good. And uh, yet, uh, um, Jerry Shields, who regularly asks questions on this uh, um, panel says, is there a potential for misguided innovation? In other words, the innovation might be construed by some actors in our sector as an opportunity to sell technologies where they're not necessarily what the actual, what the user wants. Uh, Martin Meltz, and a similar question, I suppose, says, um, in the rush to touch with security and biometrics, are many organizations looking at quick fixes and missing the opportunity to innovate and potentially moving backwards? Timo, I'll come to you first. So I, I would say, it, say it, in, in, in a way that the, uh, like coming previously, it's, it's, the, it's not about the, like making an investment and also if, many industries are, are transforming in a way that you don't want to buy a car, you rent a car, or you don't want to buy a, you know, the lights in your warehouse, you just rent a light. And it's all about this transition of, of coming from the, from the products to services and the business models in a way. So I would want to kind of turn in around the whole thing that what is the actual need the users, the customers want to fulfill. 
So the need is that, you know, for example, in a shop, they, want, they don't want to have anybody to steal from the shop. So why don't you build up your business model in a way that, you know, the, we are not selling uh, the, the, you know, the, the gates or the, the cameras, but we are selling the proof that, you know, the people are not anymore able to steal from your shop, or we could be detecting the, you know, the guns in the, in the airports and, and, and so forth. It's all about what is the actual need that the customers are having and transferring the mindset from selling a, a product which is based on the technological, whatever is the latest technological solutions. And I must agree in a way that, for example, in the AI solutions that are heavily coming into many industries, so they will be kind of flooring the current solutions where the human is needed. You know, that there's, there's a great potential for technological solutions like that, but I would be still wanting to kind of integrate that to solve the actual problems and at the same time transforming the business model of the, of the companies who are selling these services or the solutions. Okay, uh, um, let me come to you, Lewis, same question. Uh, um, your thoughts on, well, let me, uh, specifically the bit, I suppose, Lewis, that, that this issue that we could, it could be done, technology is being invented or innovated for the wrong reasons. It's not focused on the real issues. Louis, your thoughts? Um, well, I mean, technologies, I believe technologies can be used for many, you know, in many different ways. And I think that is what's happening. Um, you know, the need versus the solution. There's always different ways of developing a solution based on what you have today. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it's the question is a very valid question in the fact that, uh, you know, are we using, I, and I mentioned earlier, um, incorporating older technologies with new technologies. I think that's a great way of achieving a good balance for, you know, um, addressing uh, a product's need and, uh, you know, also incorporating new technologies. Okay, okay. Uh, Nicholas and Steve are going to come to both of you with these questions. It's building on that. It's building on the same issue, but it takes a different slide. slant. Uh, um, Gordon uh, um, Knight asks, uh, um, do you think that innovation um, could be driven by customers rather than security companies? It would be quicker. And uh, <laughs> um, if clients were demanding products, that would be the ultimate driver. It's the fact they're not in a, in a big enough way that's part of the problem. Similarly, Glenn Kitteringham, another former panelist, has said, uh, um, um, as innovators, are you giving what your customers are asking for? Or are you creating technology or adapting technologies in the hope of creating a market? Nicholas, let me come to you first, and Stephen, I'll come to you. Nicholas. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, the first thing that, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind is that any new product, any innovation, any technology takes time to develop. So the, the fact is that uh, we cannot just well, from, uh, you know, overnight uh, decide that we're going to launch this product. So we need to be in touch with our market, obviously, with all our partners, uh, the end user, analy analyze the situation and uh, make assumption of what the future will hold for the technology. And then as you move along and you keep on, uh, you know, find, um, discussing with, uh, with the, the market, then you need to adjust your solution. You need to be agile, which is the, the trendy word at the, at the moment, you know, but um, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's easy for nobody. So it's not about just launching a product uh, with the hope that it will find a need on the market or to just develop every single solution that the market is uh, requiring at a certain, certain time. Uh, you need to find a balance between the two. Do you find that clients, uh, Nicholas, are demand products? So, I mean, it's about demand, is it? Where, where is it coming from? If it's coming from clients, that's a good thing for people like you. But, but one of the, que the question here is, it's companies deciding what the market wants and therein lies a, a gap. True or not? Not, not true, not wrong. I think sometimes we can uh, think about what the future will hold in terms of what the market will need. But at the end of the day, it's always based on, on concrete facts. Uh, if companies are going to invest a lot of money in new technology, they're not going to do it just, uh, you know, on, on a bet. So uh, the, the innovation is moving at different pace. So as I said, there is the one that, you know, you look in the future, what you uh, think the market will move to and where you want to orient it yourself. But then you've got like a little adjustment as you move along uh, the, the line. Uh, 
Why? Because we, we go to see our customers, uh, the, you know, regularly. We go to forum, we, uh, we speak with everybody. And uh, once a solution is on the market, then obviously the customers are coming and say, well, you know, it would be good actually, I've got this problem that your solution is fixing, but I also have another problem that came now that uh, I'm thinking about it. What can you do for me? And that's how it works actually. It's not just, a, uh, you need to be two to tango. Okay, um, Stephen, I'll come to you then. So it's a question from Gordon Knight and Glenn Kitteringham about where all this is coming from and the, uh, the process. Stephen. Um, I, I guess from my point of view, um, as Nicholas said, then it takes two to tango. So it is a two way street. Um, and I suppose from a, from a vendor's side, I suppose they've got to listen to understand rather than listen to, to respond. So it's understanding the problems, just making, making their business decisions. If there isn't a problem to be fixed, why, why are people in, you know, innovating new technologies? And that's where we get to a point now where, where people will create a nice new technology and give it to the sales guys and say, please go and sell that. We spent a lot of money developing this. Um, but if we look at where we are in, in today, climate and I think this might be where some of the guys are coming from with the questions we we're seeing a lot of technologies rushed into the into the marketplace to address some some issues that that um, I, I guess are technology providers creating and um, the media fuss around certain issues that they know they have technologies to address but potentially um, but I guess from a technology vendors point of view if if they're not willing to sit down and listen to the customers to find out what the problem is, I think it's now impossible to actually identify technologies either in their portfolio or things that, that need addressing to, to address those problems. Yeah, okay. I mean, just while, while I've got you there, uh, Mike Cummings, um, building on that, has asked whether um, uh, um, that it costs, because the process of innovation takes a while, the danger is by the time you get something out there, it's obsolete or not as good as it would have been had it been invented when the idea came up. Um, is that a genuine issue, Stephen? Um, I, I probably more of an issue today than it has been ever before because the pace of innovation has, it, you know, it's it's exponential in, in comparison to years gone by. It's so much quicker than it has been, and and challenges uh, challenges adapt. Um, it is, I guess, it is all about businesses being adaptable, being flexible enough to, to address the, the changes that they need to make to, to make sure the technology is relevant. Um, and it's aligned to, to, I know team have spent a lot of time talking around sort of business models, service lifecycle, all of that. It's making sure that actually technology does sit within, within an ever evolving sort of space there because the, the way businesses and their procurement strategies are, technology needs to align to different business models as well. Okay, uh, Tim, I'm going to come to you next. And a question from Pauline Nordstrom, um, uh, who's been involved with us before, who says, does the panel feel that the multitude of security systems operating in silos with different protocols for each is more of, an adopt, more of a hindrance to the adoption of the technology? And uh, um, I mean, because in the opening statements, um, the different standards and guidelines and et cetera was presented as a positive. Um, it isn't always like that though, is it? Timu? Yeah, I, my original background comes from the information system science and I'm very familiar with the, you know, the, the silos in the, especially in the IT industries. And it's always this kind of um, the integration, how the different systems are actually working together. And when we have a great solutions, it, it's basically the, the more than the sum of the individual items. And for, for that, what, what approach we typically use, we, we call this living lab approach, which is kind of an in real life environment we, where we are testing the solutions with the uh, real users. It's about iterative process. And I really want to highlight this iterative process because uh, the past 20 years I've been working with the innovations, I have never seen a solution that will go straight in a, in a goal in the first round. You need multiple iterations and you collect a systematic feedback from the users. You, you test the solutions on the, on the uh, different parts and, and the finally you will have this integrated solution which is actually working as a, as a, as, as a whole which you could be then selling as a service, not as an individual product. But you see, I suppose behind the question here, Timu, is um, uh, um, this feeling that um, that thorough process, which uh, any scientist would understand, 
is getting in the way of having things that are directly relevant to users because it's just taking much longer these days. I wouldn't say that it's taking much longer. I think it's much uh, faster actually because you will find the problem pain points much earlier in the process. Because if you have a pain point in your solution, you will anyway find a doubt. And the problem is that if you find a doubt when your solution is already in the market, it's extremely expensive make corrections the further you go in the innovation process. It's easy to do the, the corrective measures in the conceptualist phase, not in the phase that you have actually done like integration test and so forth. So that's why I highlight this iterative solution, which is all the time kind of an, uh, uh, evolving in a better solutions. And that's why you actually save the time and you save the money. At least this is my experience. Okay, okay. Let me come to both Nicholas and Lewis about this question of silos. And uh, um, because it does strike me as a, as a really important point. And again, it's, it's been uh, referred to in previous uh, uh, webinars. Uh, Nicholas, the problem is that this is all operating in silos and that's getting in the way of progress. True or not in the area of biometrics with which you're familiar? So we have again to go back to basics. If you look at uh, the request from the market 20 years ago, uh, it was simple. It was, uh, I want to secure my door, uh, please open the door. Now it's not like that. Now it's, I want to open my door, but I only want to open my door if I've got two people at the door, if I've got, uh, if the two people are sober, uh, if they did a medical checkup within the past six months. So there is a lot of things which are, which are happening. So obviously all of that must, uh, work together and uh, it, it's much more complicated than just saying you know it's, it's in silos or it's not in silos. Uh, as Timu was saying you, you need to make sure that your systems are working together well and then you will have a good solution and that's basically what uh, the, the, that's why the manufacturers are working together to make sure that all the solutions are working together and bring the solution uh, to the need of the, the, the end user not the other way around. The end user mustn't adjust to the technologies the other way around. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Lewis, I'm gonna bring you in on this one because uh, um, uh, it, is a, it is an important point. And of course, uh, you've, been, you've been around for a while in your area and you've also experienced outside security specifically. This issue of silos and um, the extent to which on the one hand, everyone needs to work together as Nicholas just says, and the real barriers that come about from different, different codes, different systems, different approaches, different frameworks, different philosophies. Uh, uh, in theory, great. In practice, very difficult, as Pauline suggested. Lewis, your thoughts? It, it is a difficult situation. I mean, everyone has their, their end goal. Everyone has, you know, what they a, a need and in, in what they want to achieve. And in order to do that, it's important to work collaboratively. Um, you know, in the security area, I've seen a big convergence between uh, traditional security manufacturers and um, uh, information technology equipment. So when you when you just think about that, you have traditional manufacturers who are only focused on making dedicated security equipment, but then there's these other solutions that are high tech and they involve integration of information technology equipment. This has been a convergence that has been going on. I don't know if it's a silo, but it's, a, it's, it's prudent to try to integrate those two um, you know, technologies to, to create a, the best solution for our customers and our end users. And I think, uh, oh, I think one of on. the, I'm sorry. Carry on, carry on. One of the things that I think helps to, to uh, uh, at, or, or, or give some some direction to the solution is through codes and standards and product development life cycles things like that um, you know when you have a document that you can share between different parts of an organization you know that may break down those silos if they do exist thank you very much okay I'm gonna get another question in if I can Stephen I'm gonna come to you first and it's a question from uh, Joshua Flint and Joseph Flint says, um, are we going to see an evolution of innovation with people and processes? 
um, uh, as we evolve our technologies. You know, another, another really interesting point, Stephen, we've spoken today about innovation, mostly in the area of products, uh, which was the purpose. Um, but uh, without this, is arg the argument goes, without a similar sort of approach, a different way of thinking about their use, um, we're forever going to be stuck where we always have been. Stephen, your thoughts? Um, I, I guess there's got, there's got to be a, a sort of a, an understanding that those things will absolutely, well, they need to change if they're going to be adopted and move forward. Um, I, I, I'll probably swing back to the technology. If, if people, te technology is only a, as good as the people that use it. And if people aren't adapting to that new technology, there aren't new processes in place, um, it, it, will, it will fall by its side. Um, can I just take, I, I want to go back and answer the last question very, very quickly for two probably quite controversial points. One of the reasons with openness that we don't see is because when we have silos, um, it's a, around budgets, internal budgets. So people are very protective of their budget naturally. So don't want to, so they want to work in silos to protect their jobs. And why do certain manufacturers not want to work together? Because they will reduce the size of the wallet of the size of the project because they will lose control of, of projects and openness and open systems is absolutely business critical but one of the reasons that technology providers stop and and have closed protocol systems is because it can potentially commercially impact their business sorry martin i can't, i had to have my say on that one yeah you did and and uh, a very very good part i'm going to ask timu very quickly timu for your this just if you wouldn't mind being very brief on this specific yep. point about open systems and uh, some of the realities that, that is put up Big, is it a major problem, Timo, from your point of view? Very brief, if you wouldn't mind. You mean open system in, in, in general? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in general, in general, so, yes. So, so on the other hand, in other industries like uh, telecom industry, for example, there are certain things that the, the competitors are working together because they want to expand the market. And that's why you have to be an open on certain things about. You agree being an open on a certain areas and then you close your business in the certain other areas in order to expand the, the industry, expand the business. So I would be coming from that angle. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen around the world, we've been inundated with questions. There are so many more and uh, we're running out of time. I'm just gonna ask each of our panelists very briefly to offer us their, their final thoughts on, on this topic, just their key takeaways uh, um, from this webinar that they would like the audience to, to, to focus on. So if I can ask you just in 20 seconds, Nicholas, please, your final thoughts. Nicholas. Sure. Well, I think the, during this uh, webinar, we touched the very, very surface of the iceberg. Uh, there's a lot of things to consider when you want to cover the world security. Uh, and uh, people need to get educated. So obviously we as manufacturer need to educate the market, but the market can also push the manufacturer to, um, to educate them. And together we can uh, make sure that the, the innovations are done for the good of everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Lewis, your final comments, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think this has been a great webinar. Thank you once again for inviting me. Um, with regard to, I, I really think the security industry is keeping pace with where they should be. Um, you know, we brought up some really relevant uh, topics like silos and uh, open system development. I think that's a really important thing as we move forward. Uh, integration with new technologies, software development, and in particular, I really think it's important to, as we innovate, to always um, remember that security equipment is security equipment and it probably should have cybersecurity incorporated into it also. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Lewis. Uh, um, um, uh, Stephen, your final uh, comment, please. Just 20 seconds if you wouldn't mind, Stephen. Yep, so, so, so thank you, Martin. Uh, my final comment is, is when we talk around innovation, just be creative. Um, be willing to speak to lots of different people because there is no one size fits all. There is no single source supplier that will be able to deliver this. And actually people need to start thinking outside of the box just because it's the way that things have been done for 30 years doesn't mean it's the right way to do it today. Thank you. And finally, Timu, it seems um, I should tell the audience around the world this, the idea for this webinar came from Timu who wrote to me several months ago and suggested, Timu, it seems only right to you to give you the final, <laughs> the final word. Just 20 seconds if you wouldn't mind, Timu, we're running out of time. Yes, so I would say 
focus on the customer need, understand that, but make sure that it's, it's balanced with the technological solutions. And also I would pick on with the Steven as, as well, search from the diversity of the participant. Remember culture, organizational diversity, different users, cross, cross functionality, disciplinarity and cross industry. Then you will get far with that. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your questions. Thank you very much indeed to the panel for their insightful views. Uh, um, we could have gone on once again, and uh, perhaps that's the real strength of these uh, webinars, that um, we leave uh, asking more questions and we may well return to this topic another day. Um, okay, just uh, while we're talking about doing things rather well, can I remind you please that um, uh, 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 entries are open for the Outstanding Security Performance Awards in India, United States, Benelux, Romania, Australia, Kenya, Germany and the United Kingdom. So if you in any of those countries know one person, one team, one initiative, one company that's doing an outstanding job, can I invite you please to make a nomination uh, um, and uh, uh, um, more information on the website about the Oscars. Uh, just to say we go through it all over again on Thursday uh, where our topic is COVID-19 where to now for private security in South Africa, a panel very specifically about South Africa and uh, what's been happening there. It's uh, been a nightmare in many ways and uh, a panel of South African representatives will be talking us through the issues. Can I just say to you it's an earlier time, 1.30 British summertime. Uh, please look out for more information on the website and we will be writing to you uh, about our next set of webinars. We've been organising them um, throughout lockdown. We're going into August as well, um, where we're looking for your thoughts and uh, your feedback. So we'll be sending you an email. Do look out for that, please, um, uh, in, your, in your inbox. Uh, um, so thank you very much indeed, once again, for your uh, um, interest around the world. Thank you to my panel once again for their insightful views. Uh, an absolutely fascinating discussion, many issues raised. I'll be doing a blog and a copy of the recording will be available on the website as from tomorrow. And hopefully we'll see you on Thursday when we'll be talking South Africa and we'll be doing this all over again with another panel. Until then, wherever you are in the world, stay safe. <laughs>